thinking about it. There we go. There's my mic turning itself on. Very exciting. Um, good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jesse. I'm your virtual adventure guide here with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And I know we've got a lot of familiar faces in the crowd, but if you are new to what we do, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. I will note before I dive in with my intro that we will have a Kahoot today. If you want to join along, play along between the talk and Q&A portion of the program, this is your game pin. I will highlight this a couple more times in advance of us going live with it, but we'd love to have have you take part it's always a lot of fun now in 2014 i went on a journey with my family to what i thought at the time was the most beautiful place i'd ever been to in canada grossmore national park on the western side of newfoundland uh, my wife my now wife went with her family on my recommendation loved it so much as well that literally about seven months ago she got a job offer out here in cornerbrook in the west coast of newfoundland and we thought man we could live near that we can live near this really special gem of planet Earth. And so we have moved to the western side of Newfoundland from Toronto. Grossmore remains my favorite place I've ever had the chance to visit in Canada. And the moment I moved here, my sole goal was to have a program where we could feature and showcase some of the incredible landscapes, history, culture, and, and just this place that we have the chance to, to call home now. And I'm so excited that today we get to fulfill that dream with Cedric, who's joining us as an interpreter from Grossmore National Park. Today, he's going to specifically talk to us about maintaining a healthy forest in this really, really special spot. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome in Cedric. Thank you so much for joining us, man. And uh, take us away. Take us on a journey. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, welcome, Jesse, to Western Newfoundland, and welcome every classroom uh, today from Canada, from other places. Uh, my first thing is a warning, careful with Newfoundland, careful with Grossmorn. It is a very special place, and typically you come a first time and you come for longer, so you are another victim, Jesse. It's a very unique place, and today I'll do my best to share a bit of the culture, the nature, and then dive into the forest. Can everybody see a nice uh, image of two uh, animals on the slide there? Because I'm pretty much ready to go. We are ready to go, man. We see our, your two animals. We're going to learn more about them and all sorts of other stuff. So let's dive in. All right. All right. Perfect. So first of all, this is one of the landscapes in this park, uh, a fjord carved by ice called Western Brook Pond. And wherever you are in your classroom, from now on, you're not in your classroom anymore. You are in gross morn. So tele teleport, everybody. Do, 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 do. Everybody teleport. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath and take in all of this beauty, this incredible natural beauty. You are here in gross morn. And it's not only nature, it's also culture. I would like to acknowledge the fact that Western Newfoundland has been lived on by people for not hundreds of years, but thousands of years. There's 6,000 years of human living on this land, making a living of the waters and the land. Uh, and it's wonderful to be able to be here uh, and sometime, you know, visit National Historic Sites and parks to kind of dive in into these stories. So here I'd like to pay a tribute to the people of the Maritime Archive tradition, uh, the people of the Grow Water tradition, the Dorset tradition, more recently the Beothic, the Mi'kmaq people, and then many, many European, European descendants coming down here, mostly for fishing. So it's a beautiful mosaic of uh, people, and it's great to see that this land and these waters have provided for human for millennia. I'd like to pop up this slide here. You've recognized that big, beautiful northern country. It's Canada. You see a bunch of dots, some red ones, some green ones. Uh, this is a bunch of brothers, sisters, and cousins of places. Whatever you see in red are national historic sites. There's 171 of them. Whatever you see in green are national parks, and there are 47 across this beautiful nation from ocean to ocean to ocean. And wherever you are in this country, or even if you're you know, in a different country, I invite you, whenever you visit Canada, try to hit any of these places. These are protected places uh, for education, for enjoyment. They are a little treasure, a little corner of this country it's with stories and with beautiful nature that we know are protected for today and for all generations to come. So it belongs to you. Make the most of it. And Grossmore that you see here is a mountain here, is one of these 47 national parks. And basically there's a firework in the sky there because this year Grossmore is celebrating 50 years of existence. 
The St. Cradle Park was created in 1973. So in 13 of August this summer, we have big celebration. It's been 50 years. Uh, and it's a very unique uh, national park. And I'm going to try now to describe it a little bit. So like all other parks in this country, it protects ecoregion of Canada. There's 39 ecoregion. We have 32 represented so far. So we're aiming at more parks to represent all these ecoregion. And two of the main ecoregions here that Grossmont protects are the St. Lawrence lowland, because we are, you know, on the coast of the St. Lawrence. And the other one is the Western Newfoundland Highlands. And not everybody knows, but the whole section of Western Newfoundland is a big mountainous mountain chain called the Long Range Mountain with fjords carved by ice. And it's a beautiful section of the country that is protected in this park. It's a place of spectacular landscape. It's a place of geological significance where mountains like these orange tablelands for example, uh, have been moved up with continental collision. So a place where you see very, very unique places. And in this picture, you see a little town there where a few parks have towns around, you know, uh, the national park here in Grossmont, there's nine enclave community, not one, not two, nine. So when you visit Grossmont, you have this outstanding natural landscape, and then you have this very living culture in these uh, little fishing communities. And most importantly, this place is cherished and protected, so we know it will always be there for you, your kids, your grandkids to be enjoyed. And another thing, maybe my favorite slide of the presentation, like any other park, we have to make sure that the ecological integrity of this park is protected. So that means to have the right creatures in the right numbers in the right places. And whatever you see on this slide, all live in this park in various parts of the park. So it's a big job to make sure that the plants, the animals are doing fine. And there's a bit of monitoring and research done by the RESCON section, the resource conservation section. And they focus mostly on three different ecosystems. So we monitor the Arctic alpine ecosystem that's high of these highlands. And in the picture, you can see two little birds there, two rock time again, blending in. Freshwater ecosystem. So we monitor the freshwater. There's a salmon fence there. We've been monitoring that for years. And then the forest ecosystem, which is a very important one. And that's the one we'll be talking about today. So here it is. This is a map of Grossmont. It's a pretty wide park. It's about 120 kilometers wide by a good 200 kilometers uh, tall, 1,805 kilometers square. And whatever you see in green there is the forest. So things to be known, noticed from this forest are that it's mostly a lowland forest. Whatever you see is gray is these highland plateau where it's mostly tundra shrub vegetation but the forest is in the valleys it's mostly coniferous forest we'll be talking about which trees and also we are in a subarctic boreal climate so very long and cold winters this is a picture last month my wife and one of my four kids exploring the big white landscape wonderful time to explore is in winter you can go wherever you want and you can enjoy nature in so many different ways skiing, snowshoeing, and simply playing in the snow. And be careful because as you explore, sometimes you see animals. I can see one, two, three moose right there living in this boreal forest. So we've all heard boreal forest. What does that mean? Where is that boreal forest? Here you go. Here's an image of the boreal forest and it's a big green belt. Uh, that, and you can see it started with Newfoundland on the east, and then it covers the northern section of all Canadian provinces up to Yukon and Alaska. And it's only it's not only a Canadian thing, it's actually a world thing. You have another picture here. You can see again on the left the Canadian section of the Broad Forest. And on the right, you see Scandinavia, Russia, up back uh, to Asia there. So this is all the boreal forest, the forest from the north. And that's what boreal means. And there's that big ring, ring of green forest on the north. There is none on the south, not the, because there's not enough land out there with uh, the Antarctic. But now is a question for you. Anybody here would like to maybe go visit the forest of Grossmoor? Mm-hmm. Just put water here. Let's do it. So wherever you are in your classroom, I allow you children to stand up if you want. Okay. Close to your desk. 
Okay, uh, maybe I'll do it too. Okay, you stand up and then go down that trail. Yes. Now you're in nature. And I always tell people, use your senses in nature. Use your senses all the time. But in nature, smell. Everybody smell and yeah, touch and look and hear. You can taste some stuff, but be careful. Now look closer, look closer. Look at some of the branches there on the left. Right on. See, when you pay attention, you'll see everything in nature has a purpose. It's part of a big, big system working together. Here, this plant is a tree there. You can see the needles on the two sides, a few needles there. This is your typical Christmas tree. We call it the balsam fir tree. Okay, and it's very chewable, very soft needle. Uh, some animals love it. Moose love it. Uh, bunny rabbits love it. Then if you look up on the middle of the trail there, there's another tree there. It's another coniferous tree. So a tree with cones that has needles. But look at the needles. They're smaller. They go all around the twig. They're much harder, more prickly. And this species is called spruce. So you've heard about this name before. So balsam fir is flat, needles on the side. And spruce has needles all around the twig. And it's more prickly. Animals don't much eat much of that one. And sometimes you look at the bark. Some trees will have this beautiful paper bark. You know it. That's the white birch. And sometimes there's a yellow one that's a yellow birch. These are the three main trees that make the boreal forest here in western Newfoundland. And the most common one is balsam fir, first one we've seen. So now that you're in the forest, I'm going to ask you to like, choose a tree. I'm actually going to bring you this virtual forest. Go to a tree. And I want you now to just... Take a deep breath, feel yourself in the forest, and eventually it's now you. You are the tree, so I want you to feel your feet are now roots. They go down the ground to get nutrient, and you feel your trunk, you feel the nutrient going up, and then you can stretch up your arms, stretch up your arms. Go and search for this sunlight, and through the process of photosynthesis, every time you breathe in, well, you breathe in carbon dioxide and you store that. You build their own carbon material and what you release is oxygen. So you're very important for the planet. You're the lungs of the planet. I'm sure you've heard about that. So forests are extremely important for the earth. Planting trees is extremely important, especially in a time of climate change where we're trying to, to, uh, to regulate the planet. So... Deep breath, deep breath. You're the tree now. Slowly, you're going to become the kid again. You're the child again. And we're back in gross morn. And you can see the forest. And I think I hear a little sound coming. <laughs> what is that? What is that? We're flying over. There's something flying over the forest. <laughs> of gross morn. Well, well, guys, guys. I think that must be that Rescon science crew doing some monitoring. Let's go check it up. Well, what do you think? Anybody here has been in a helicopter before? I only did a couple times. Well, here's your chance. You thought you came to a virtual presentation. No, no, no. We're going for a helicopter flight. Let's do this. Yeah. So let's fly. Woo. We see <laughs> all right so look at this landscape look at this landscape so you see these trees you see the river look at the backdrop there with the coastal lands there we're flying right over grossmore national park Whew. everybody hold oh. your breath yeah <laughs> all right <laughs> Huh. All right, everybody, you can land back to your desk. I, I'm sorry, I should have warned you that we would be flying today. Uh, I hope you, you fasten your seat belt. And uh, we're now still flying up, so I guess we see now an image of the forest. Do you see the image of the forest back from the sky there? Uh, it's uh, taken from one of our photographers, and we're going to keep flying. And we're looking at more forests now. And look at the forest. Some places is doing well, but some of the places, look at that. It's mostly gray and it's fall down trees. And most of the fall down trees are blowdowns, we call them. The wind would blow down trees, and that's a natural process. Blow down and insect outbreak. So uh, every 30, 40 years, you have insects coming in and they help rejuvenate the forest. This is natural regeneration, but sometimes it doesn't look the healthiest. So maybe we're going to do our landing, everyone. So be ready for landing, everybody. We're going to leave the sky, go back down, and we'll land into. 
the back country of Gros Mont National Park, a very quiet place. Let's walk a little bit around and explore some of this forest that doesn't look to be so, so good. Let's keep walking. And right on, okay, there's a few trees here right in front of us. You can see the needles, I would say it's probably bassam fir. You see the flat needles on the side. And look at these trees. We actually call them candlesticks. They're not very high, maybe a couple feet tall, almost no branches, all kind of stuck onto themselves. Very strange. Let's keep walking. Oh, that's one of our colleague Ray is doing some monitoring of the vegetation here. And again, I always told you in nature, use your senses. Now I'm going to ask everybody, look in the background of this picture. Look at the forest. You see these trees, probably birch trees. I see the white trunks there. But look at the one. They have green on top, but there's no green on the bottom. So I can see you guys actually looking at this. That's something we call here in this park. We call it the browse line. Browse means to eat or to munch on something. So there is somebody or there's a creature that is munching on these trees and it goes as high as it can, which seem to be pretty high. And then it kind of eat all the vegetation there. Let's keep looking for more signs. Oh, I can see down on the ground there. That's chocolate pellets there. Is that chocolate? I bet you the class from Porto Bass know what that is because everywhere in Newfoundland, you'll find these and don't eat them. No, this is poop. This is scat from a, a specific animal. And let's look more in that. That's the track probably from the same animal. Hmm. I wonder which animal that would be. Any classes have any guess of which animal it would be? Hmm. I think we kind of seen some earlier. You're right. This beautiful, strange looking, still majestic animal. Moose. Look at the big snout. Look at the eyes and the ears. Very good earring sense. Very good smelling sense. Very poor eyesight. And an incredible animal now with the youth there probably. Born in May. So that might be like an early summer picture there. So yes, you're right. Moose, 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 moose. Has had a big impact on this forest. Original en français. Diam. In big mine. Alces, alces. In Latin. And moose is a very big animal. That's the largest member of the deer family. It's super big. It's taller than me. It's 6.5 feet tall, two meters tall, and it's super huge. The weight is up to a thousand or even 1200 pounds. So you know your own weight. It's probably eight or 10 of you student together. That's the weight of a moose. That's crazy. <laughs> as big as a horse, if not bigger. I'll tell you a bit more. It's a hungry animal every day. It eats 50 pounds or 25 kilo of vegetation per day. So that is a lot of pressure on a forest. 25 pounds is pretty much the same amount as a bale of hay, which on a tree would be a good chunk of a tree. Imagine every day a moose eats that much. And that weight is approximately the weight of a seven grader. So I think we have grade fives. I'd say even it's pretty much your weight. So every moose every day eats your weight of vegetation that's crazy and a last little feature that is quite interesting is that newfoundland is an island as we've seen and moose are not native to this island they were introduced to this island as a source of food quite a long time ago and we'll do a quick history of that section of uh the uh, the, the fauna of the island of newfoundland and oh i have a guest dr morris von morsen is going to talk to us. Hello, everybody. Yes, I wrote a big paper on the introduction of moose to Newfoundland. And uh, some people write papers of pages, pages. My paper, my paper has three words. First word is introduction, you introduce. My second word is multiplication, they multiplied. And my third word is reduction. They multiplied so much that at some point we had to reduce them. Thank you very much. That's the end of my thesis. Oh, wow. Thank you, doctor. Uh, well, I guess let's check a, a few secret documents I found from Dr. Van Moosen. And the first one tells us that in 1878, two moose from Cape Breton in Nova Scotia were introduced to central Newfoundland. So that's a long time ago. That's almost 150 years ago. We're not sure what happened. We don't think these two first moose survived. They were introduced as a source of food for the people of the island of Newfoundland. So later on, a few more years later, in 1904, Four moose from New Brunswick were introduced to central Newfoundland again. Now we're talking about bilingual moose from the Miramichi area in New Brunswick. It got out of hand. 
uh, and we'll just see what happened in this province. So the multiplication started with two, four, maybe six, but more likely four moose in the wild in Newfoundland that eventually add little babies and eventually multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and eventually moose spread it all across this island. There's a moment about 20 years ago, we reach a peak of 150,000 moose on this island. And it's a big part of the culture in Newfoundland. Everybody here pretty much hunts. It's part of the economy too. People from away come here for hunting and it's pretty much guaranteed trophy. Uh, so, it has impacted uh, the society, the economy, and also the ecology and the vegetation. So what happened in Grossmont, I wonder? Well, we have to remember that in Grossmont National Park, one of the two national parks in this province, the other one is Terranova, close to St. John on the East Coast, hunting is prohibited. So nobody hunts moose. What's going to happen with your little moose? They'll even multiply more and more and more and more and more. And... Uh, the vegetation has been impacted very, very seriously. Moose everywhere. I used to drive from north to south of this park. And in the spring, when they come close to the road, sometimes we'd count 25 moose. They were everywhere. Collision with vehicles. So a big issue. Uh, we'll do a quick history of moose in this park. So the park is created in 1973. At the time, uh, there's about 500 moose. Uh, that's what the records say. And there's no hunting. There's lots of food, and there's no major predator. They used to be a native Newfoundland wolf, but it got extirpated in the 1920s, 25, as European move in with their cattle and sheep. There was a bounty on wolf, and it's said that the last one was killed just north of the park in 1925. No major predator. A black bear, maybe, maybe a, a eagle might attack a young or an injured moose, but surely they got it easy here. There's no major predator. So in about 25 years, the 500 moose would become 14 times more. So whoever is good at math would know that 25 years will bring us to 1998. 14 times 500 is, you got her, 7,000 moose in this park. Now, Grossmont is 1,805 kilometers square, an average of four moose per kilometer square, but some lowland density are up to 14, 16 moose per kilometer square. The vegetation is suffering. This is bad, bad, bad. The forest is in danger. What are we going to do? Remember what Morris, our doctor, told us. There was introduction. There was multiplication. Next one was, yeah, what was it? Yeah, reduction. All right, so you want to reduce the moose. So a question for you classes, and I think I'd like to have a quick break now, see what you think. So here's my question. What would you do to reduce moose population in Grossmont National Park? I'm opening up the platform now to whoever has any crazy idea, good idea. Uh, <laughs> bring it on, bring it on. All right, well, I'm going to head to Mr. Dunn's class. They were our first ones here today before the broadcast got underway. So Subbury, if you guys have a thought, what do we do to reduce moose? Well, we, certainly have lots, we certainly have lots of moose here. So uh, what do you think, uh, Owen? What? More wolves? I mean, more wolves? Yes. Wolves. Okay. I like that. Okay, Kate? Oh, uh, take the moose out and ship them to somebody else? Nice. Here you go. Here you go. Two great options. Grade five Alliance School. I'm going to head to you guys as well. If you want to unmute your mic, what do we think? Come on up. Hey. Hunter? We have a student with an idea. Perfect. Uh, you can move the moose to um, different kind of places. Like, say, if there's not as much moose, say, I don't know, in Alberta, then we can move them to Big Mac. Ah, transport the moose. Move the moose. We're transporting, we're bringing in wolves. How about Miss Wells class? I'm going to go to our Port of Bass class as our last one. What do you guys think? All right, Emma. Hmm. Just say it at live. Oh, bringing them different places. Bringing them different places? We are, you guys are so uh, kind to, <laughs> we're going to just ship the moose and to Alberta specifically. I like that that was chimed in there as part of that. Just like give the Albertans the moose. Calgary or run with moose. We'll ask what they think in our next program with them. But Cedric, tell us what, what we're actually doing. Ab absolutely. Thank you so much, everyone, for the answers. And let's look at a few answers. 
uh, and consideration that this park has taken to decide what would happen with these moves. The first one is called natural regulation. It's pretty much to let nature do its course. Uh, so basically, it's about predation. If there's predation or not, there's not much here. And it's very much about food supply. So if there's enough food, uh, animals will multiply. When there's not enough food, they're going to have smaller birds, smaller population. And that's kind of what happened. 1998, we have about 7,000 moose. About 10 years after, in 2010, we have about 5,000 moose. So it's naturally regulating, but not enough. The forest is really suffering. So we have to look at more efficient method. And one that I heard a couple answers on it is relocation. What you guys uh, and gals have said to transport the moose elsewhere. Now, moose is a big animal. We're dealing with not 10 or dozens of moose. We're dealing with thousands of moose. So it seemed it was a hard one to, uh, to pull through. So we look at other options. One was fencing. So this park on the left, on the west, as the coast of the St. Lawrence, on the east, as the mountain of the Long Range Mountains. So there is a boundary that we could have fenced, but so much work, so much fencing. And then it's not good for ecological integrity because species cannot go through. So we kind of said that one don't work. Predator reintroduction, I heard that one with the wolf and that one was seriously considered because this one is actually good for ecological integrity because wolf used to be part of this ecosystem. However, it has bigger implication. There's towns, there's farming, and there's a general fear of wolf. But wolf could be a very good um, uh, option. And it's been done in other parks in Europe and other places. We have introduced top predators like wolf. But that's not the one we've chosen. Another one is called lethal control. That one would be that you'd send a bunch of rangers and just get rid of the moose or shoot them and let them rot on the spot. Uh, that doesn't sound very good. And that's a big waste, really. So I'm not sure about that one. And there's another one we kind of thought of. We're not really sure about it. Traditional sustainable harvest. We just kind of thought people in this province have always hunted moose. So maybe, you know, this park could be part of uh, the provincial game license. And so we looked around and eventually the selected moose reduction option that prevailed was indeed that traditional sustainable harvest. And eventually zones in this park entered the draw for the provincial uh, moose hunt. But it's a different hunt. And I'm going to introduce you quickly a couple of hunters that I know. Uh, that's one that looked like me with the red t-shirt and one that looks like my neighbor. And basically, it's a hunt where you go usually up the hill with sleds. And once you quarter your moose in four, you put it on the sled and you slide it down the hill. And eventually, it will fill up your freezer. You can cube it to make stew. You can make moose jerky. You can make moose burger. Uh, and it's a wonderful way to have natural, organic, free-range food amongst the best meat in the world. Now, I'd like to say that. You know, not everybody eat meat. Some people have a churn, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, but many cultures on the planet, you know, everywhere you try to get your food locally. So both, you see veggies here, we're trying to get that locally. The people in this province that get their meat uh, from moose and caribou and their fish and their berries, like it's a very sustainable way to get your food. And finally, I'm almost finished the presentation. I'm just going to dive in a little bit into that moose harvest program so you have a quick idea of what happened and what is happening. So it started about 12 years ago in 2011. And what happened is that uh, every year, about 600 licenses are given. You apply on a pool, and then your name is picked out or not. I've applied since 2012, and if I say two years out of three, my name will be picked out. Uh, however, it's a hard hunt. You cannot use motorized vehicle, uh, so you cannot go on a quad, on an ATV a vehicle. In the winter, you can go on a snowmobile, which is kind of a special deal for a park, but it's allowed here, providing there's enough snow cover. But most people will do like my neighbor and myself, will walk uphill, get the moose up and slide it down on the sleds. Or you can take boat. You see water, there's a bay in the middle there. You can go by boat. Some people have been walking. There's uh, some people that use wheelbarrows. Some people brought Newfoundland pony to carry their, their moose quarters. So uh, it's a hard hunt. Other places in the province, you take your truck, you can cut trees, you can make a trail with your quad. It's different in this park. Uh, and it's been a very successful, big scale program. So in 2011, there was about 5,000 moose. And in a matter of about 12 years, we're now 
at just above 2,000 moose. On this park, that is 1,800 and square, this is a manageable moose density, finally. So we see sign of the forest that is doing much better. So that's what we would see everywhere. Look at this poor little tree, Munchan, barely any branches. Now you go on the trail of this beautiful park, what you'll see is balsam fir and other trees doing very, very well. The needles are back in. And you see the forest. This is a picture here. You see the taller trees. But look at the smaller tree. It's a paler green there. And eventually, you see also the leaf trees there. So even the hardwood, which have leaf trees, they're doing much better. Uh, the fir trees, the conifer trees are doing much better. The little shrub, that's Canada U there, but raspberry bushes. All the little plants are doing much better. So it's working very good but it's not the end. What is next for this forest in the park? Well, we have first off to maintain that population to that manageable level of about 2000 moose. And unfortunately in the central kind of lowland area of the park, some moose meadows, we call them, have not been regenerating. We call them uh, moose meadows. It's like a savanna like landscape. And we will have to help out nature with a project of forest restoration. So you see a healthy forest there, but some areas look like that. Not that many, it's dozens of kilometers square. So small parts, but still there where trees will not be able to do it on their own. And that's why we started two years ago to have little trees be grown up. And that's little fir trees there. And we're starting at the end of the summer. So in August, September, we're gonna start at that. And today is part one of a program in the fall. The plan is to connect again with Explore by the Seat of Your Pants and mostly talk about that restoration project that we're just starting. So thank you very much, everybody. I'd like to say merci beaucoup. Thank you. Well, I'll talk to everyone. And now is probably a chance to ask any question and probably to do that caboose with these three or four questions. Fantastic. Cedric, thank you so much for such an uh, incredibly enthusiastic journey and an unexpected helicopter ride in there as well. Uh, always a pleasure and what an exciting uh, program today. We've got a ton of kids in our Kahoot already. Uh, over, where are we at? 106 kids are already in our Kahoot. I'm going to get the frog out of my throat again. I'll give you all a second to come join us in our Kahoot and then I will get underway. For those who are new to it, the faster you answer, the more points you get. You don't win anything, but you do win our everlasting respect. So I'd love to have you guys chime in and, and get underway. We are going to start with our first question, and then I'm going to go to Mr. Dunn's class first for questions when we dive in with our Q&A period. But let's get underway with our Kahoot. Cedric, are you, feel free to come out of screen share entirely so you can see us again. Um, oh, yes, for sure. Yes, we want to hang out together. The question one, the forest of gross mort is not doing so good because of which animal? I hope you guys are on board with this by now. Is it caribou, moose, squirrels, or elephants? Rogue elephants that have made their way to Newfoundland. We'll have to ship them to Alberta as well. Well, just all the big animals that end up here straight to Alberta. That's our lesson. 60 acres so far. I hope you guys are on board with our, our moose, of course, uh, for this. Very, very good. Uh, we will see who's our leaderboard. Again, fast you answer. Awesome Raccoon takes our lead. Way to go. And we will dive in with question two. All right. This is a, an easier Kahoot for some of our Kahoot friends that have joined us for a while. What type of forest grows in Grosmore National Park? We talked about this early on in the presentation. There's a beautiful campsite in Grosmore. Tropical forest, boreal forest, rainforest, or... And I'm doubting this is the answer, but it is delicious. Black Forest Chocolate Cake. Mmm, I might have to get some of that when we're done the program together in a minute. One more second. 86 of you in. Let's see. It is, of course, Boreal Forest. You guys are, are killing it with these easy questions. I'm glad. Great Quail takes our lead. Got to be quick. Quicker you answer, the better. To reduce the moose population grows more. And moose are floated off the island by boatloads. We just put them on a ship and send them around. And can't reach Alberta that way, but you can go to BC, you could go to the Caribbean, that would shock them. Um, moose in Florida, who knows what would happen. Eight, 90 answers so far. Ah, uh, Cedric, I think they got it. I think they're like on the ball, this crew today. Our, our many, our over 100 students, this is amazing. Way to go. False, we did not ship moose by boatload. We, we, that wasn't even one of our options. But I like where your head's at. That could be a, maybe that's something gross more to consider in the future for our 48 true pickers. Great quail maintains the lead, barely. Going into our final question. 
And then, Mr. Dunn, I'm coming to you guys first. Moose were introduced to the island of Newfoundland from which other Canadian provinces? Okay. Is it Quebec and Ontario, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, BC and Alberta, just shipping them right back to Alberta, who we gave them to us, or PEI and Vancouver Island? Mm, all lovely places, by the way. And I think we can say all of those places. PEI, yes, everything there has national parks on it. So you can go visit a national park in all of these places, which is wonderful. The answer is close by in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. I'm still shocked at how few they introduced to lead to the population. You would have thought like 100 might have been a good benchmark, but there you go. Forest grows more and tropical ferret is third inexplicably with a rabbit face. Diplomat impala with an owl face. And winner, way to go, is da, 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 Great Quail. If you are any of these people, let us know who you are in the chat. I know we've only got about 10 minutes or so for Q&A, so I'm going to dive right in, Cedric. Thank you to Mr. Dunn's class, who were here 18 minutes early, which is pretty impressive. Hey, Great Forest. <laughs> fantastic. That was a great presentation, Cedric. Uh, I was one there last summer, and it's a fantastic place. Uh, Kylie has a question. How many lakes and rivers are in Gross Morn? Yeah. How many lakes and rivers? No pressure, Cedric. No, no, I love this. This is not dozens. This is not hundreds. I'd say we're talking about thousands and a lot of little lakes. I, I pop up that map. There's a lot of little lakes on the highlands and there's many rivers. But what I'd like to mention, there's seven or eight rivers that were so uh, old and so cold and so big. There was rivers of ice that carved fjords. So this park has seven or eight major fjords, which now have rivers in them, but are not just small little river beds. They are massive. But amongst that, you also have the little brook system. So my answer to be uh, exact would be probably 1,347 lake <laughs> and probably 623 rivers. I love it. If you ever get the chance to fly into Deer Lake Airport, which is the gateway to Gross Moor, you're flying over just this endless landscape of little lakes and rivers and it's just one of the most beautiful flights in you'll ever have in your life. So, Mr. Dunn, I'm glad you got the chance to go there. And for our other students, head on up and come visit us in the future. Uh, grade 5 Alliance School, I'm heading to you guys. Unmute your mic. Ms. Wells, you're next in a second. But High Five Alliance, come on in. Unmute. Come chat with me. Hey, guys. Hi. Yeah, yeah you're good. Oui, il y avait beaucoup de mains. Il y avait des questions? Emily, quelle question? Do you know how many rivers there are? Like, oh, <laughs> right. That's my question, Emily. <laughs> okay. I, no, I see that we have more insistence on the rivers. And I said thousands of lakes. I moved it down to 600 for the rivers. Um, one thing is sure... Uh, maybe, you know, it might be four or five hundred rivers, uh, but I'd like to talk about the diversity of the rivers because you see orange mountains. So there some rivers have no trees. It's only orange rocks. Some rivers are highland rivers where there's landlocked uh, trout that only live on the highlands. Some other rivers are big and massive and the whole watershed of the river is protected in the park, like the big fjord we've seen. Some of the brook are tiny and I go there with my four kids. We go swim in these rivers. It's the best. So... There's lots of rivers, and one thing is sure, everything is so pure here. There's barely any people. We're only a few humans scattered here and there in the in the nine communities. We're about 4,000 people in this huge landscape. So everything is pure, beautiful rivers. And, well, we're not supposed to tell you you can drink water, but there's places in this park, like if you know where the water comes out of the ground, there's even springs you can drink the water out of. It's a beautiful, pure, protected place. I yeah, just Thank you for it. Yeah, yeah. It's a great question. I'm so glad they're Kenai rivers. And I've shared this picture of the Tablelands, one of the most unique landscapes on this planet with a little stream going through it. I have put my feet in that stream after a long hike, and it is one of the most relaxing things in the world ever. So I'm, I'm glad we got this uh, this interest, guys. Um, Miss Wells class, Porta Bass, welcome in. Uh, come on in grade sixes and take us away. Hi. Hi. <laughs> What was the first group of people to discover Gross Moor? The first group of people, you said, eh? That yeah. is incredible. And, uh, you know, uh, we say discover, but we discover is not really a term we 
is the exact term, I think. It's mostly which group kind of lived here. And it was a group that would live in the headlands on the coast. I'll, I'll describe the group. I'll tell the name after. Uh, they would be like you and your family. So it'd be your brother, sister, your cousin. You'd have maybe your dad and maybe your uncle and and then maybe your grandparents are there and you travel together, maybe 12 or 15 of you, and you follow the resources. So in the spring right now, you're on the coast down, I guess, port of Bass, but even port of Chois, you're hunting for seal. And basically in the summer, you fish everything you can from the sea, the cod, the salmon and nets. And eventually in the winter, you move back to the interior because it's too rough on the coast. And then you focus on the, maybe on the caribou and on the inland animal. And all First Nations that lived on this island did that. It was winter, winter grounds and summer grounds. And the first one that done it, a little bit around Port of Basque and the whole West Coast, they were called the Maritime Archaic People. Maritime because most of their resource was based on the sea. Uh, and Archaic because their tools were pretty simple. It was usually mostly rocks, wood, and bones. And they would attach together. You'd have some sort of, a, you know, an axe. And eventually you made out toggles. You made out a bow and arrow. And a toggle would be the, the little end of your spear would be attached to uh, your uh, your javelo or your your arrows and it would stick in the animal and a great place to see that is just north of this park a place called Porchoa as a national historic site just about that but that was the first group about 6000 years ago now the pyramid down in Egypt it's about 3 4000 years ago so it was even before pyramid people were living making a living out of here so that was the first group but then there was more people the dorset tradition the grow water tradition biathic mi'kmaq a bunch of people, and today, Inuit, Inu, Meti, and uh, uh, Migma, it's still a beautiful mix of culture that still is very close to these resources from the sea and the land. Cedric, uh, I hope our students can find something in their life that they are as passionate about as you are about explaining the wonders of this park. It's fantastic. Um, great question, guys. We're going to try and take uh, five more questions. I know we might need to go a little over time, but stay with me if we're rebels together. Ms. Cottrell's class, I'm heading to Baldwinsville. If you want to unmute, uh, come on in for a question. Hey, guys. Hi, what is the main focus of your job? Is it researching, testing data that is collected, or studying animals at the park? or something else that your job is focused on? Pretty cool. This is a very good question. And everybody on this call, if you have an interest in nature, consider it in your list of potential best jobs ever to walk, to work for any of these 47 national park or national historic sites. I started my career as a summer student working with visitor service, talking about price and trails and kilometers and i moved on to the very exciting section called interpretation where we deliver program just like we're doing now but on site we talk about the rocks we talk about the fishery with people with the resource in front of us so with the fish with the rocks and uh, for the last couple of years i was lucky enough to move to the resource conservation section of this park and exactly like you said it's pretty much to get out in the field, check out how the animals and the plants are doing, do very specific research to count how many trees, how the trees are going, or how the, the snow is melting, or how many salmon go up the river. And then there is the data. After the data collection, you have the input of the data to check out what's happening. And it's part of the process. And then you have the report uh, write up where you actually explain what is happening and what's the next goal. And right now, uh, one of the main priority, well, the, some of the priorities are the caribou population that is kind of borderline, moose that is better now, kind of uh, 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 more manageable uh, level. Caribou, what I'm saying, borderline, we have low population and a lot of car accidents. So caribou is a big file. And then the forest is better, but these zones where we'll need to replant is another big file. One thing remains certain, uh, this is like, it's a dream. If you like nature, please consider working with parks because you'll be protecting these places for the nation. So thank you for joining and keep nature in your life for sure. We've uh, we've got a, a deal to do a bunch of programs on the Gross Morn side and on Newfoundland and Labrador in general. So I encourage our classes to check out that in the months to come. And of course, if you're interested in hearing from more amazing Parks Canada interpreters, our Cross Canada virtual road trip, our summit series, we've got so much on the go. It's like an incredible amount of programs in the next few weeks. Uh, five one, I'm going to head to you guys now. Come on in for a question and take us away. Why, why is Gross Morn Park called that name? 
This is a very good question. I have a French accent. I grew up in Quebec and came here for one year. It's been 20 years. Uh, and a hundred years before me, this old west coast of Newfoundland had a lot of Frenchmen coming from France for fishing. From the 1700s until 1904, this was France here in western Newfoundland. It's called La Côte Française, the French shore. But people were not supposed to stay. They were just supposed to fish in the summer, go back to France and Spain. And there was other countries too, but mostly France. And these French people for 200 years named the places. And there's many French names. port au basque port au basque It was the Basque people. port au choix means a choice of port. And Gros-Mort. So everybody knows what Gros means. Gros means big. Mourn has two meanings. So mourn as an adjective, it's something that is mournful, that is gloomy. It's kind of sad. And as a name, uh, it also means an isolated hill. So the whole name Gros Mourn means big isolated hill. And it refers to the pink mountain I showed at first with the firework. Well, this mountain, when you're fishing or when you're on the water, this mountain is higher of about 100 meters from the other mountain. And it's different. It's pink. It's bald. There's no vegetation. And we named it. The French, the French fishermen named it Gros Marne, which means big, isolated, gloomy hill. And it's so true when the clouds are kind of hanging into it. It is. I, I've driven past it many times, and most times it's covered in cloud. There is a hiking trail to get to the top of it, which I will have to do when I'm feeling very energetic someday. Um, Miss LaForge, I'm heading to you, Miss Mustard, and then Kimberly's class at the end uh, to wrap up. Miss LaForge, come on in for five. Hi. How old do moose live till? How old do moose live till, Cedric? So a moose theoretically lives up to 17 or 18 years old, but typically in nature, we're talking about more of the 12 to 15 years old. Um, and usually by the second year, a moose uh, is on the go. It can already reproduce. And every year, Usually the female will have one moose, often twins, may, you know, a third of the time you'd have twins. So often a female will have twins. So it multiplied pretty fast. Uh, but I'd say the average age of the moose here, I'd say between four and seven or eight year old. And it is not true that, let me check what I got here. See, see my beautiful antlers. So you just count the antlers until you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight point. That's eight year old. This is not true. This is not true. This is not true. But typically, the antler will grow bigger as the animal grows bigger. But you cannot say that, you know, there's 10 point, it's 10 year old. That's not true. If you want to know the age, basically what we do, uh, let's take a tooth out. You slice it very, very thin. Look at it in the microscope and you can count the ring exactly like on a tree. And that's how you count the age of the moose. Very cool. Thank you for that, Cedric. Um, we are going to oh, Miss uh, Crow's class has a bad connection. You guys can share a question in the chat if you'd like, but I will let the Miss Mustard's class in a minute. And I will note too, Cedric, having moved to Newfoundland, I am thrilled to be here in every way. The one thing that we are missing is really, really great Indian food. And our next class is from Brampton, which is the best Indian food anywhere outside of India. So I, every time I hear the name, I just like, my mouth waters a little bit. Uh, but come on in four or fives and take us away. I'd love to hear your question. Hi, guys. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hi. So, how many animal species are there in the park, and are any endangered? Nice questions, guys. This is so good. This is so good. Uh, I wish I had all my big document. I'll start with the plants. There's about 782 plants that have been recorded, but every year we record more. Last year, I think we found 20 new species of lichen, you know, lichen that hangs out from trees or on trees. Uh, and for animals, this is hard to tell because you have fish, you have the birds, you have the animals, and there's the migratory animals. So an animal that lives in this park doesn't only live in this park. Many birds are here for part of the year, and then they go back down south uh, in the, the winter months. Some The caribou that use this park, the park is one-third of their whole range. Um, if I had to say how many animals, I'd say probably about, you know, at least 30 type of fish, probably 120 type of bird, and probably at least, you know, uh, there's not that many mammals. We're on the island of Newfoundland, so mammals, many mammals were introduced. There's only 14 native mammals, so you won't find raccoons, you won't find uh, skunk, you won't find groundhogs. There is squirrel and chipmunk that were introduced. There is uh, bunny rabbit that were introduced. So for mammals, there's not that many. For birds and fish, 
fish. There's tons and for plants too as well, especially that you see mountain is orange, a mountain is pink. The diversity of the flora is just mind blowing. There's flowers that only grow up here, nowhere else in the world, endemic species. Really, really cool plant. As a, as a mover from Ontario, the plants are amazing. The weirdest thing is uh, we get a lot of Southern Ontario groups today. You're all used to all the squirrels everywhere, like 20 squirrels in your street. There's like no squirrels here. It's so weird. And every time I see something shuffling, it's not a skunk. It's not a raccoon. I don't know what it is. It's like someone's dog because there's no, when I went back to visit Toronto, it was like, you guys are like overrun with squirrels. It's terrifying. Anyway. Cedric, this has been so much fun. I want to give our classes a big chance to say a huge thank you and farewell. So I want to note, if you want to learn more about Gross More, check out this link below, specifically the forest conservation, learn about all the amazing stuff Cedric talked about and more. Um, and you can find out with this YouTube link, and I will share this with our classes after, some really cool stuff going on in the park as well. Cedric, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for joining us today, man. Thank you so much, everybody. So nice that you were able to have a little visit of this park. And again, wherever you are, keep nature in your life. Get outside, connect with the trees, connect, take the deep fresh air. This is a big, important thing to hang out with nature. So please do that. Absolutely. By the way, I wanted to note just before I bring in the class to say farewell, when you told kids to stand up in the forest, like everybody stood up and they all stretched and it was amazing. Deep breath. So way to go, classes. Um, Mr. Dunn, Grade 5 Alliance, Miss Wells, Miss Cottrell, Miss LaForge, Miss Mustard, join me in saying a big thank you.